Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I am here today to record for the Zenobia Award channel with Dr. Scout Bloom, and we are here to help you write your concept proposal, and part of that is doing historical research, which Scout is here to talk to us about. So uh, let's, let's, let's get the skinny on this. <laughs> okay. Um, so just by way of background, um, I am a practicing historian. Uh, I have a PhD in American history from uh, the University of Houston. So, and I've been a, a professional historian for 25 years now, so quite a long time. Um, I think what Liz and I kind of want to go over with y'all is not to frighten you and make you think this is a horrifying process, but to give you sort of the basics of how historians do their work so that, that um, you know, you sort of understand what level we're expecting uh, and, and the kinds of good sources to use when you're doing your, your research. Yes, absolutely. And so, um, you know, sorry if we're going over something you already know, but we're just trying to make sure that uh, everybody is able to have a very positive experience with Zenobia. So let's start with the very basics. So Scout, what kinds of sources should people generally be looking for uh, as they begin their game research? So historians work with a lot of different kinds of sources, um, and we generally categorize them into primary sources, which are like firsthand sources or, you know, things from the horse's mouth. It's, it's from the time period that, that you're discussing. It's from people who were involved in the event or knew of the event uh, directly, generally. Um, those are primary sources. And those can be all kinds of different things. Um, they can be things like diaries or letters or photographs or, you know, even like tangible objects like pottery or different kinds of stuff. So the primary documents can be all kinds of, of different things. Um, we deal a lot with written documents, but we don't have to. In my research, I do a lot with um, fiction. I do a lot with movies and music and those kind of things. So you can include that in primary documents as well, depending on your topic. Um, we also use secondary documents and secondary documents are basically um, people have used primary documents to come up with an account of the event or thing or whatever they're they're talking about. So these would be sort of your books uh, about history, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, generally, um, if if you're doing research, you want to look for good secondary sources and not just sort of any book on, you know, whatever you're doing your topic on. And the way to do that often is to look in the publisher's name, whoever has published the book, to look for university. Now, this mm -hmm. isn't the only way to find a good, reputable book, but if you find a book that's University Press of Kansas or University Press of whatever, um, that means that it is an academic press. That means that it's been peer reviewed. In other words, the author has submitted it and um, our peers, other historians, have looked at it and said that it was it was OK to publish. So it's yeah. gone through sort of a rigorous process. So when you're looking for secondary sources, in other words, books to read about your topic, think about, you know, looking for one from an academic press by an actual working historian. You can look and see, you know, look them up on Google. Um, in, and I'm not saying that books by journalists are bad. Um, you know, I just read an absolutely amazing one on, on uh, Africa Town by Nick Tabor. He's a journalist and it was a really, really good book. But to, to stay academic and to sort of stay within sort of peer reviewed history works would, would be a much stronger thing to do for your, your research. Yeah, I mean, I have, especially because I don't have full access to an academic library and I get that. Um, for me, it's also, you know, it's it's not that somebody who's not an academic can't write a great history book because they really do. But I would at least be looking for who is this person? Right. Do they have an educational background that indicates they actually know what they're doing? Or are you looking at like somebody who says that they have a PhD in microbiology, but they're trying to tell you about American history? Not that they wouldn't know, but, you know, you should kind of think about, OK, does this person's background match what they're telling me? Um, I, you know, is this person working at a newspaper? Is this person, you know, you have, have they written several books on these topics and they're just working in the field for a while? Those are the things I'm always looking for. And then do they have footnotes and a bibliography in the book? Are Absolutely. sources being cited? And so yeah. if you're looking for those things and that it all passes the sniff test, then I think it's okay to proceed. <laughs> yes. 
Um, you know, and as you get into the process, if you're looking for sources and you want to ask one of us any of that kind of information, you're you're welcome to do that. Of course, um, you know, we'll, we're happy to provide uh, help, and and I'm sure your mentors will. Um, you know, if 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 uh, you ask them, they will be more than happy to do that. But right. So one of the things you have to consider is what sources you're getting your information from. Right. You don't want to be thinking just about getting it from blogs of people who sort of randomly begin to write on this or, you know, stuff like that. You, you want to try to stay with more reputable sources, particularly like Liz says, where they have footnotes um, and endnotes so that you can see where they're getting their information from as well. Yeah. And the other thing I kind of want to mention is that, you know, it's important to do the research and record what you read so that you can also cite your own sources going forward. You want to make absolutely sure that as you do your research, that you document what you've been reading so that you too are able to cite your sources going forward, because that's that's the historical standard. And that's true for games as well as for any other kind of media. Yeah. I think one of the things that I do that I've always found really helpful, and I tell my students to do this is, you know, once you get done writing, reading a book to write, like, you know, just type out sort of a page summary and it doesn't have to be really, you know, fancy or detailed, but just to sort of write down uh, and to keep clear in your head what that source helped you with and what information you got out of it is, is useful. Absolutely. Um, I will also give a tip that I learned in my grad school days, which is if you're reading a book that you really like, um, and you're learning a lot from it, what you should do is when you're done with it, immediately go to the bibliography and write down anything that looks interesting or that you think yeah. you can get from there. Uh, because it's like a web. The more of the, the more you read and understand, the more sources will start to repeat. So you can tell which sources are the really common main sources in your area. And also you have a chance of finding some really interesting little treasures in other people's bibliographies. So yeah, and if you're reading, you know, multiple books on a subject, which I would strongly recommend, and Liz and I will talk about that in a second. But the first one you read, it might take a little while because you're having to read the whole thing. But once you've read several books on a topic, you can kind of start skimming through stuff. And like Liz says, sort of see, um, you know, what they have in common and what they don't too. So, um, you know, I would I would definitely recommend um, mining for sources, like Liz Liz said. I mean, that's always a good way to find additional additional sources that are good to use. Absolutely. So um, we also mentioned the word historiography. Occasionally when we're talking about these subjects. What does somebody mean when they say that? And why shouldn't you panic about it? <laughs> Our stu my students panic about it quite frequently. Um, you don't need to. Historiography is the history of history. And that sounds a bit bizarre, but basically, you know, one of the things that people often have to get over is history is not just a set list of facts and dates. Um, as historians do their work and as historians write history, we um, offer different interpretations of those events. So history, the, the telling of the story of what a historical event, event is, has changed over time. So a historian looking at the American Revolution in the 1950s, for example, would have a very different version of, than a historian writing the story of the American Revolution in the year 2023. Um, historiography is just how that process of telling that story and what those different themes are um, over time. It um, is influenced by a bunch of different things. Um, historiography is influenced by your background, um, you know, where you come from and what who you studied under as a historian can, can influence you in many ways, your, um, your points of view, your ways of looking at things. Um, it can also heavily be influenced by the time period that you write in. Um, the, that 1950s historian about the American Revolution, for example, might be someone who's really emphasizing unity and progress and someone, you know, who's, who's talking about the American Revolution as a unifying, you know, powerful, strong event. Um, and because that was during the 1950s and we were being, uh, you know, in the middle of the Red Scare and worried about, um, you know, trying to seem unified in, in the face of Soviet aggression and all of these kinds of things. So that 1950s historian might have been very influenced by the times of the 1950s and the, the you know, second Red Scare, whereas today we might have a very different view of that uh, and sort of see how it affected African-Americans or how it affected women or um, you know, how it really wasn't a revolutionary kind of thing at all. And, you know, so the, the point being, historiography is important because what you see is that the telling of the story of history of one event 
can t change over time quite a bit. And so you want to be aware of that. And that's something really important with a lot of these projects is to try to read widely from different historians to get at those different perspectives of, of history and of what um, how historians have been telling the story, because that will give you a much richer game and a much richer flavor to the history that you're telling people about. Fantastic. So uh, our time is short, so let's boil it down. Basically, read widely, think about the context of what you're reading, and do the best that you can to make sure that the sources you read are reliable. That sounds, sounds right. Good. That sounds great, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and keep a record of what you read so that you can cite it to us, and then we can go mine your bibliography. Uh, thank right. you. So thank you so much, Scout, uh, for giving us a primer. And to those of you who are either competing in Zenobia now or planning to do so in the future, best of luck to you. Uh, we hope this is helpful. Uh, go ahead and ask questions and happy designing. <laughs>